One evening, a young lady named Harriet Beecher Stowe sat down with her family and listened to a letter being read aloud, and it was from her sister, Isabella, in Boston. The New Fugitive Slave Act, which was a part of the Compromise of 1850, had gone into effect, and the letter from from her sister in Boston uh, just simply reported that you know, southern slave catchers and even northern people who were catching slaves for profit and even innocent black people and just selling them anyway were prowling the streets, hunting down black people, destroying their shops, busting into their houses. And the letter described these horrendous daily attacks uh, and how it outraged African Americans, um, abolitionists, and people who were opposed to slavery and who resisted those slave trappers. Uh, and sla- this, it, the Fugitive Slave Act, even though it was supposedly it was to be a um, kind of a trade-off between anti-slavery people and southern slave owners in the South as part of that Compromise of 1850, its effects were terrible. And it literally created just mob-like people who were going into cities, these slave catchers, and taking black people and, and chaining them up and bringing them back down to their owner. This was so-called justice at that period. Anyway, but Harriet Beecher Stowe, she lived in Cincinnati for many years, um, and it was just across the Ohio River from a slave state of Kentucky. So Harriet Beecher Stowe, she met a lot of runaways and, you know, listened to their tales, and uh, and she even visited Kentucky and, and saw it firsthand how pathetically miserable uh, that institution is and wondered how could a human being do that to another human being. But after reading her sister's letter and being outraged by the treatment of slaves and ultimately this Fugitive Slave Act, um, she was even she was already a writer. But this encouraged her to write something to kind of let people know and depict in a story the realities of slavery. So because of the Fugitive Slave Act. And even though Harriet Beecher Stowe was already opposed uh, to slavery, but it was this Fugitive Slave Act that just really took it to a barbaric level. The idea of slave catchers taking slaves who had escaped to try to find their own freedom in this world were drugged back like dogs to the plantation. Um, this inspired her to write what was what would become Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, that way, you know, as she said, she would use her pen. Um, that would make the whole nation and the whole world um, visualize and hear the tales of this just accursed institution of slavery. So she began writing Uncle Tom's Cabin and she ran it in a anti-slavery newspaper uh, for an advertisement and in in 1852 it sold over 300,000 copies in its first year. And for the 300,000 copies is tremendous for any book. But in that day, that age, before television and radio and mass advertising, just lets you know the popularity of it. How just the word of mouth, uh, it had to have been, it was it was a powerful book. Uh, but 300,000 copies of anything, even now with social media marketing and everything else we have, it would be hard to do. But nonetheless, um, Mostly northern people and people who were against slave, slavery um, loved the book. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin had a profound effect on people who really didn't know one way or another how they felt about slavery. Um, but she depicted uh, in her story the enslaved hero of the story was Tom, and the villain of the story was Simon Legree, who was actually uh, a northerner who came south and owned a slave. But anyway, um, in the book, she just presented African Americans as real people, uh, decent people in in prison uh, and enslaved in just the most pitiful circumstances. Um, But she depicted slavery uh, in more of a realistic, it, it, it resonated to people, her story. It gave them a better visual image of it, especially people who weren't around uh, the plantations in the South. Um, and it did. It changed a lot of people's hearts, and it 
further outrage people. There were already a lot of people who were outraged over slavery. There were a lot of people who opposed the Fugitive Slave Act and all these different um, agreements and compromises on it. Um, but this had a just had an absolute profound impact on people. I can't I can't um, emphasize that enough. But um, Southerners, of course, were outraged. Um, and they actually came up with some responses to her book as well. Some of the Southern uh, literary pseudo-intellectuals uh, wrote some tales about how slavery was a necessary good uh, and that they, they even criticized Northern industry as being a, a different type of slavery, uh, basically wage slavery, it's because they underpaid people to work in the slums of the city. Uh, so they kind of pointed out some of the problems with um, the wage earners in the northern factories, but nonetheless had a profound impact on people, changed a lot of people's hearts. Um, but even despite the outrage, the book sold millions of copies. Dramatic impact on public opinion. Uh, even the Queen of England wept uh, whenever she read it, and the Prime Minister of Britain, um, it certainly pretty much guaranteed that they wouldn't, they couldn't ally themselves with the Confederacy once they develop their own uh, independent nation when they were seceded. So Uncle Tom's Cabin wasn't the only unintended consequence of the um, Fugitive Slave Act. Even though the Fugitive Slave Act, which was conceived as a part of that um, Compromise of 1850 by Henry Clay to benefit slave owners in the South and to appease them, the Fugitive Slave Act actually turned to um, hurt Southerners even more because more and more people became hostile and of course we know Harriet Beecher Stowe's book um, helped that feeling of hostility towards slavery. Um, but under the Fugitive Slave Act that was created in 1850, um, anybody could claim that an African American had escaped from slavery and had to only point that person out as a runaway to take him in, her into custody. Um, the accused runaway slave would be brought before a federal commissioner and a sworn statement that the captive had escaped from a slave owner or testimony by white witnesses was all the court needed uh, to have the person accused and sent south. So you could accuse someone, all white jury was going to decide whether or not the slave was um, going to be guilty or not. And to make, it, make matters even worse, African Americans accused had no right to defend themselves and were not even allowed to testify in court, even though they were supposed to somehow, through somebody else, prove that they weren't a slave, they couldn't actually stand up and testify because they were black and didn't have any right to a trial, which is completely ludicrous. But here's another bad part about the law. Not only did the black person have to find a way to prove their innocence, and they had to do it in front of an all-white jury and all-white commissioners, um, there was also financial incentive incentive for the commissioners to find in favor of the slave owner. And what I mean is, if the people in this court, if the, com the commissioner, um, if the commissioner decided that the slave owner had a right to capture the slave and the slave was guilty of running away from the plantation, he got paid $10. If the commissioner in that court decided that the slaveholder was um, was not um, justified in trying to bring the black person back on the plantation, and the the, the um, African American could remain free. He only got five dollars. So uh, it's a horribly just inhumane law. Uh, it was just corrupt beyond anything you could imagine. But the law also stipulated that federal marshals had to help slave owners capture African Americans as a part of the Fugitive Slave Act, and if they didn't. Uh, they could actually be uh, jailed and fined. Anyway, the Fugitive Slave Act was a wretched policy. Newspaper accounts of the seizure of African Americans and descriptions of the laws and justice just fueled uh, at the anti-slavery sentiment. Um, it was just really, really, really tough to even put into words how how big of an impact the Fugitive Slave Act had on the abolitionist and the anti-slavery spirit in America. And, you know, there were just several instances to where white, black people collaborated together to resist the Fugitive Slave Act by hiding slaves, by trying to fight uh, 
off and literally get into gunfights with slave owners and slave catchers whenever they wandered into northern towns. Uh, there were situations to where, um, you know, there would be literally innocent black people on northern soil just snatched up and brought into the south. Even free blacks were even captured. And I'll, some of you may have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, uh, Solomon Northrup, who was a musician who was tricked and conned and um, drugged by slave catchers who pretended like they were recruiting him for a band. And um, they went out drinking one night after you know, he played him some music and they put some stuff in his drink. And then he woke up in chains and back to the south he went. But he was one of the lucky ones. After 12 years, which is, would be an eternity on a plantation, he actually gained his freedom. So this Fugitive Slave Act is really, really wretched. Um, but northern resistance and outrage grew um, over this Fugitive Slave Act, and obviously we know Frederick Douglass, who was probably the voice of black men and women at the time, who was an escaped slave himself. Um, Frederick Douglass emphasized um, this Fugitive Slave Act over and over in his speeches, and he was such a good uh, speaker. Um, but nonetheless, he reached out and um, severely resisted this act and claimed that if it took it, then it would maybe it would take a few bullets to stop these fugitive slave acts. But nonetheless, the, but the, probably the most significant um, series of protecting runaway slaves and people who were being pursued by these slave catchers was the Underground Railroad, which wasn't actually underground. Um, and although the Fugitive Slave Act induced heavy fines and prison for helping a runaway, um, whites and free African Americans continued to help them escape to the north and even into Canada through this Underground Railroad, which was just a it was a system of um, different houses and different points that people could hide the slaves while they were escaping to go north. Um, the people called conductors helped transport the runaways north in secret, gave them food and shelter along the way. It wasn't actually underground. It was just a just a series of paths, towns, houses, cellars that they different people who cooperate cooperated would help get the slaves to a safe place. Um, a lot of them went to extreme northern states, and some of them even went to Canada. Uh, even slave trappers and catchers would try to um, get the Canadians to release some of the runaway slaves, but the Canadians mostly refused. The most famous of these conductors was Harriet Tubman, who was herself a runaway slave. She took many trips to the south. Uh, she also helped slaves escape in different times of the Civil War, and when the Civil War was actually broken out, she was kind of a somewhat spy for the north, and she actually went in and helped um, free slaves in South Carolina who actually turned into northern soldiers. Um, but nonetheless, this this Underground Railroad helped an estimated 2,000 African Americans uh, or, or more um, escape, thousands of them nonetheless, escape to the north um, to you know, get away from the plantations and to um, rid themselves of any danger of slave catchers or anything like that. But Levi Coffin is another uh, gentleman that should be noted. Uh, he was a Quaker uh, born in North Carolina. He helped just thousands of people uh, at his um, home in Indiana. And then when he later moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he helped another 1,300 African Americans escape who crossed from Kentucky. Uh, but these people were, were tremendous um, Samaritans for our, for our country's history, and they should be forever enshrined into um, our history books and our um, memory. But Harriet Tubman, they called her Moses. Um, obviously, if you read the Bible, Moses helped um, you know, part the Red Sea and helped the Israelites and all that. But she was she was incredible and as she went on even during the civil war and after to be a speaker of civil rights um she was really tough uh, she survived you know severe beatings when she was on a plantation uh, fractured her skull um, she had terrible blackouts for the rest of her life because of it but she still worked uh, she actually had a brain procedure done without anesthesia
uh, which would be uh, incredibly painful and scary to most people, but um, that just it displays her toughness and her courage. But nonetheless, the Fugitive Slave Act um, provoked um, Harriet Beecher Stowe to write Uncle Tom's Cabin. Massive impact on anti-slavery sentiment, all, all types of Northerners and black and white together, and even people in the South helped um, run these slaves out of you know, bondage and help hide them out from slave catchers. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act was just absolutely wretched. Underground Railroad was obviously pivotal in helping some of these people get to their freedom. But nonetheless, the Fugitive Slave Act would really stir uh, the storm of anti-slavery sentiment.